This is Kaleidoscope and I'm Caitlin Shore. Today I'm here with Dr. Giles Gyo, a biologist based at Cambridge University who has pioneered the science of eating. Today we're going to talk to Dr. Yo a little bit about his career trajectory and the role that community played in it. Welcome, Dr. Yo. Well, thank you very much for having me in this very nice place. Oh, thank you. What has been the most joyous moment of your career? There have been many joyous and very not so joyous moments. I guess there's two types of joy. There's the discovery joy. Mm -hmm. And I think that that very, very first time we found that I found the first of those new series of obesity genes, mm -hmm. um, I think that was very difficult to match because then then I begin to expect to find new chasing mutations, right? That's yeah. it, chasing the high. So I think it was when we found that first mutation, you look mm. at the sequence and you go, no, 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 not really, no. And, and I think it's difficult to replicate that first sip of the ice cold beer on a hot summer's day. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about today. <laughs> but I think there is also something uh, uh, very joyous is when I got my first big grant. And, and this one happened to be a very super big grant. It was a, um, when we were in the EU and able to apply for such grants, uh, a big EU consortium, you know, a big, relatively big, three million euros. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I wrote it together with the consortia and I got it. I said, oh my God, they gave me the money. What, what, what am I going to do with the money? And so I think those are probably two of the most joyous moments. That first one, which was so visceral, mm -hmm. was very difficult to describe. And then there was almost saying, oh, I'm a real scientist, I got a grant <laughs> type of thing. When I heard a little bit about your story, I was kind of struck by the fact that we often think about a scientific career in terms of pursuing a discovery or pursuing like a tangible goal. But I feel like um, in your case, um, which is the case of a lot of people, um, it was largely shaped by social interactions and community. And I was wondering if you could tell me about um, how that unfolded throughout the course of your career. It's, I think it's not only about social engagement and, and community, but also blind luck. Yeah, sure. And, and, and just decisions that you made because of these social engagements love you know Ooh. just mo mo moving things and I'm you know it's foreshadowing all the exciting yeah. things that are going that are going to come for people who want to li listen about that um I don't know I, it's just it's it's interesting I'm, I mean guess how did I end up in Cambridge yeah because I'm actually originally from um California from San Francisco mm -hmm. and I did my high school and I did my undergraduate at, at at Cal Berkeley and um and I was only in Cambridge for a summer, some of, some of my junior year, mm -hmm. I went and spent a summer in the lab. Mm -hmm. That that was the kind of that was the kind of thing, you know, because I thought okay, everybody spends a right. Summer this in is the lab. what you go to do: lifeguarding, a lab, lab, something like that. Was it really? <laughs> and I thought I thought I would do the England thing. This yeah. is what I said. So sure, Dad, I'm going to do the England. Do the England thing. thing. And I was a, a aspiring medical student at the mm -hmm. time. I'd taken all the exams, mm -hmm. um, and I went with a stack of my medical school applications. Okay, this was mm -hmm. the first time I'd actually been working within a proper lab so so not like in a practicals within a college type of lab yeah. which is a class yeah you know i would have thought that it would have been claustrophobic that i would yeah. have been spending time with all these people and yeah. end up but no i loved it and as i was leaving and i was doing a debrief mm -hmm. um, with my supervisor and he says do you want to do a phd so i said yes <laughs> and all the applications went in the bin and i changed that one little thing that one little debrief and that one little question mm -hmm. then changed and suddenly in, at the end, when I graduated in 1994, I ended up finding myself on a plane, a one-way plane mm -hmm. journey um, to Cambridge to, mm -hmm. start my, to start my PhD. What do you think that you loved so much about that early experience? Or was it just uh, that guy said, do you want to do it? And you said, yes, can you say yes to everything? No, I think it probably actually... Do I say yes to everything? <laughs> I'm just now that you, you asked that question. I'm just wondering if I say yes to everything. No, so so what the interesting thing, I guess, I guess I was lucky. The group of people, there were probably about 10 of us in the lab at the time, you know, senior, mm -hmm. someone senior, junior, there was PhD students and there was me, the undergrad placement student for the for the summer. Um, I really liked the whole community of it. I really did because we, we were we were together. Sometimes people disagreed. Sometimes they did this. But at lunchtime, we would go and sit outside when the English weather would allow us to. Mm -hmm. We would go for, I, I was introduced to the concept of the pub. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm this American mm -hmm. um, kid in the Oh, I arrived in the college. So, so, so there's very, very Harry Potter-like. We have these colleges which are equivalent to these 
the houses, Slytherin mm-hmm. and Gryffindor, and this is Wolfson, which I went to. Wolfson, mm-hmm. Slytherin, Gryffindor. And so I was there to study pufferfish. Okay, so so you're in grad school, you're study, studying pufferfish, um, you're kind of, you're on track to becoming a proper scientist, right? Yeah. You're no longer the days of undergrad. What was your experience of community at that time? I think there was two types um, of community. There was the community within um, a graduate student setting, which was very, very international. Um, and that was, and also the huge cultural shock of of moving from California to mm-hmm. to Cambridge and it's 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 weird I never thought the culture show was going to be that big because we both speak English mm-hmm. sort of. um, and but it was it was absolutely enormous and so I did end up finding sort of a community of other students to hang out with but the largest community was obviously within within the lab it took me six a good six months to just understand my role within the hierarchy to really get into the groove and enjoy i'll use that uh, mm-hmm. to really enjoy being there yeah i think in any kind of workplace and certainly a lab there's an, there's a learning curve of in addition to learning the actual hard skills also learning what is the culture what is the community and and there's sort of like unspoken i don't want to say peer pressure but peer forces that help you learn what's expected of you was that your experience yes there? Absolutely. It's, it's, no, no one was pushing anyone. I'm not talking about, you know, no one was hazing me and stuffing my, sure. my, my you, you know, head yeah. down the toilet. It, but it was just within a lab, there is going to be a norm and an expectation, which is, which is absolutely fine. And so it just took me a while to adjust from being that undergraduate to the mm-hmm. PhD, um, how hard I was expected to work, certainly within that specific lab and that specific set of yeah. norms. Yeah. Actually, now I've only just, it's only just jumped into my mind since I'm actually talking, talking to you about this. I remember this was probably just before that six-month period, five months. And I had found my first interesting thing, shall we say. Okay. All right. And we needed to follow it up. I needed to repeat it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I had done it, and it was end of the week. It was Friday, and I was very, I was very excited. And this was the senior postdoc that was looking after me because my PhD supervisor was a superstar. Okay. So he was hardly ever there. So the senior postdoc was there and he says, well, let's look, let's repeat it. So, you know, you can do it, blah, blah, blah. You can repeat it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. This being Friday. I said, Saturday. I says, I says, tomorrow is Saturday. He says, okay. I mean, it's your PhD. <gasps> So then I says, ooh, okay, I think I've just been told off there. Yeah. I, said, I said, so, so yeah. I came, obviously, I came in on a Saturday. I, mm-hmm. did, I, did, uh, I did what I had to do to repeat it. It, it, it repeats it. Um, and then, actually, I didn't want to say, I, wasn't a, I don't want to sound like a lazy, lazy thing, but I, I wasn't. I, but I began working harder after that. Is that a mm-hmm. positive thing? I'm not sure. But I did begin working harder after that. And I, I got, into the, in, got back into the lab environment um, a, a, a lot more. I think there was different mm. expectations of me, yeah. which I had not adjusted for. Yeah. That's, that's what I meant to say. So like two questions. One, you alluded earlier to the idea of pubs. So I just want to get you on the record explaining any key differences between a pub and a bar. Oh, yes. For the, for the people that want to for, 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 for those yeah. of you. So I still go. So a pub is a, is a family-friendly place. Um. Now, not, okay. So let, let, let me be clear. Past a certain time in the evening, yeah. a pub sort of becomes a bar. But during the day in a pub, um, they might serve what we call pub grub. And, and the pub is a public house. Yeah. Okay, so I don't think that wasn't a complete detour into a pub. So it was a burning question that I had. My question as it relates to science is, do you feel like uh, you got any science or community building done in those more social contexts, especially during uh, your uh, graduate work? Oh, yes. I think not only during my graduate work, I think forever, ever since. Mm-hmm. Um, because the pub was not a place where you... It depends when you went. So what we would always do, and this is, a, this is t- t- terrible for anyone listening, um, is if something bad had happened or if something good had happened, mm-hmm. now this could be small, like the experiment working, mm-hmm. or the lab got a new grant, mm-hmm. okay? Or something failed or whatever, we would go to the pub, yeah. okay, and so we would go either at, uh, depending when, either at lunch and actually, and actually, you know, on a Fridays we might even have a pint during mm-hmm. lunchtime, <gasps> you know, um, or it would be we would leave work half an hour early and yeah. go to the go to the near, nearest pub, and so it 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 became a point where it was actually okay to not talk about work mm-hmm. or to talk about work. Mm-hmm. You know how some people says we should not yeah. ban work at the dining yeah, thing, yeah. whatever. 
But we were there and we would talk about many things, but we would also often end up either commiserating, celebrating, those are things that one do, does at bars and pubs, mm-hmm. um, but actually trying to fix problems. Mm-hmm. And, and if you actually, what, we've, what I found at any rate was you remove yourself from the scenario as these things always are, you're talking about whatever the experiment that I failed, the machine, whatever you could, blah, blah, blah. Then you say, wait a minute, and as you're there, and then sometimes we would actually, I don't know how legal it is these days, after having a couple of pints, says, let's try that. <laughs> and we would then run back to the lab again yeah. and I repeat that thing, yeah. but, with, but with that tweak. So undoubtedly the pub um, formed, and, and remember, this was still new to me, right? I'm still mm-hmm. the Californian in mm-hmm. shorts with that Stars and Stripes mm-hmm. t-shirt. And, and so it was an interesting experience. And to this day, all this, this I, I love pubs and you still love pubs and you still love science yeah so there you go exactly um okay so this is your your phd so take me to like towards the end of your phd you're thinking about the next step how do you go about figuring out what's next you see i people have asked me this question before expecting a strategic answer Mm -hmm. expecting a master plan i expect nothing yeah good coming towards the end of my phd i had a job waiting back in California mm-hmm. because my superstar uh, a supervisor had labs in multiple countries he, and he had a lab at UC Berkeley. So he offered me a lab back in Berkeley, mm-hmm. which is where I did my undergraduate. I said, wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. And so this was always the plan. And, um, and then my wife was, my wife, my girlfriend at the time was applying for, she's also a scientist. Mm-hmm. She's also a scientist. And so she was, that's the other positive thing about community. A little segue. So in the end of my first year of my PhD, mm-hmm. um, a new lab moved down next door mm-hmm. okay, in, 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 in our lab. And it was the PI, the professor was a, was, was a man, but it was a lab full of women. And I met her and one thing led to another and we were together. And okay. so what then happened was she was applying for money to come back to California. She's English, mm-hmm. okay? And she didn't get the money. I remember that she came into the lab, she was in the lab next door, she walked in and she said, I didn't get the money. I'm so sorry. And she walked out and I says, oh. And in my head, I thought, well, what the hell am I gonna do? And I just elected, I says, I'm gonna stay. And so I decided, this is, this is another one of those inflection points mm-hmm. in, my, in my career. I said, you know, I like it here in Cambridge. What am I going to do? Where, what is she going to do? And so I, I decided to stay. I, I love this story because it highlights the fact that you have your scientific community, the people mm-hmm. in your lab. You also, in your case, your partner is a scientist. But not but in the same also, lab. But not in the same lab, mm-hmm. right? She is a more social, non, non-colleague, right? Um, and I feel like often... Again, we think about, well, clearly you just go to the, the place that your work is taking you. But it's, science doesn't exist in a bubble. It exists in the context of the Life. rest of our social connections, right? It, it can't just be, when people are partnered, it can't just be, I'm strictly following the science. Well, you can if you're a sociopath, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or, if, or if that's not going to be joining up the to you. The sociopath loophole. The, so, yes. that, the sociopath loophole. But you're absolutely right. It has to be... You would hope it has to be a team decision, mm-hmm. and um, and so it was a team decision for to stay, um, and so yeah, that's 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 what I, I didn't think about it like that before, but yes, that that's that's what happened, and so now I was in a situation where having had a job waiting for me, I now had no job, yeah, and um, and this was when I began to think, oh God, how, what 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 am I what am I going to do? And I thought, well, I am a good geneticist. I hope you know someone was willing to offer me a job. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's when I went a knocking um, in the department, trying to trying to trying to find myself a job. I don't know why I didn't look for adverts and apply to them like any normal human being. But um, we worked in a relatively big department. It was in the, we were in the Department of Medicine uh-huh. at, uh, at Cambridge. Um, and so I says, my supervisor, my superstar supervisor, mm-hmm. was his, was superstar. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, he ended up winning. The, he got the Nobel Prize in 2002. So he was, he's a They're real... not so bright. He, he's not so bright. He yeah. was a real superstar. But I, he got the Nobel Prize for nothing I did. I want to... I just... <laughs> I should have it to point out. But the halo mm-hmm. around yeah. um, Professor Sidney Brenner, mm-hmm. okay, um, extended, which meant that when I knocked on the door to say, I wasn't just Giles, your molecular geneticist pufferfish. I was a student of Sidney Brenner. Mm-hmm. And so hence, first door... No luck. Second door, I walked in, and it was this guy called Steve O'Ratley. Mm-hmm. And he was just six months out of discovering the first couple of genes 
that when mutated caused severe, severe, severe obesity in kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so not that I knew any of this, I'm going to be fair. So I just knocked on the door, but he was looking for a geneticist. So this is, this is mm. just complete serendipity. I knocked on the right door at the right time and he hired me pretty much on the spot. And that's how I ended up working in, in obesity. So when you, when I hear about the course of your career, I hear about a lot of like open doors in some cases, literally. So I'm hearing a lot of pros for the, the community support in science. Were there ever any instances where you experienced the opposite, where uh, people told you no, or you just got general bad vibes? When I was a young um, PI, young, young, young faculty, and um, I did see some awful behavior, like really terrible behavior from other faculty members, like actual bullying. And so I'd have um, these PhD students, young postdocs, you know, they would come to me and sometimes they'd be crying and I'd try and help them. I hated that uh, couple of years of my, of my career as a scientist and not because of what I did or not because of what I didn't do, yeah. but because of this whole scenario. I hated it. Science is hard enough without someone trying to squash you. Yeah. Uh, this certainly informed the way that I run my lab mm -hmm. and that I am very, very, very mindful of even when I'm annoyed because something has gone wrong and we get annoyed or someone should have been doing something different or whatever. Okay. I am hugely mindful of how I handle the situation, uh, how I handle the situation. And this, you could imagine, um, people dropping out of science or, or, um, in a slightly better case scenario, maybe switching labs, studying something completely different simply because this person is a jerk. And, uh, um, many of them did leave and they have left science. Um, and as far as I understand, pretty much forever, mm -hmm. we could have used that talent with, with within the science. Mm -hmm. And what is that? What is that? That's yeah. terrible. Yeah. Because again, like science, isn't just some, uh, intellectual pursuit that conducted by robots, right? Like you're a human, you're working with humans, the happier you are, the more likely you're going to keep doing what you're doing. Do you, do you feel like a sense of joy and fulfillment has played a role in, in your career? I think so. I mean, it's not unmitigated joy sure. every single day because most, most, you know, most of the time things don't work. Yeah. And so it's frustrating. Yeah. But I don't, I still love what I do now. Mm -hmm. I still love waking up and doing the things which I've, which I've done. I think um, you do need to enjoy what you're doing, um, see what it's for, even on the days that are frustrating, right? And so if you don't have that joy, mm -hmm. um, overall joy, then the moment the first frustrating thing hits, you, you're, not, you're just not going to push through it because this is just not worth it. This is not worth getting yeah. up for bed for. I'm not going to do it. So now for me, I still enjoy what I'm doing. Um, because I've had the fortuity to work within labs, which are obviously small units of, of, of yeah. communities. And I've, been, I've had positive experiences almost all the way through, which is actually probably explains why I'm still here. How much of that joy, to the extent that you've experienced a joy, I know it's not every day, how much of that do you think has to do with the people and communities that you've worked with? Oh, I, I think it's almost entirely about the communities that you work with. What, what keeps you doing what you do within the field, I think are the, are the successes within purely within the scientific things. Oh, I'm going to stay within the field more to try and understand this question more. Okay, mm -hmm. That keeps you within it. What keeps me within science yeah. in general is the interactions um, with the human beings at all, at all levels. Um, and this I'm talking about from an academic position, like mm -hmm. within the university and mm -hmm. within the broader community, but also from a science communication point mm -hmm. of view, going out, speaking to, 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 to the people. It's all about the people that keeps me within, um, within science. The successes in science keeps me in the field of obesity. Were there any other experiences where you learned or your course changed because you expanded your community? So about, um, so I'm just thinking the timings wise, about two years after I started this new job mm -hmm. and I had done, so the, the excitement was sort of dying down. <clears throat> I, had one, I had one big success in those yeah. first two years and a lot of non-successes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, but you, you had a spike, it kind of went back down. Um, my, uh, it was the summer of 1999. Mm -hmm. And my uh, now fiance. Okay, um, things are progressing. Things are progressing, okay. right, right, right. So, so she had to go to Stanford, okay, for the summer. She had to, she's a scientist, as I said. She had to go to Stanford for the summer. And so I was thinking, well, I could do the options. I have options. 
either she goes and I just continue working um, in Cambridge mm-hmm. and I go visit her for a vacation. Okay, mm-hmm. option A. Mm-hmm. Um, option B, I take a very long vacation and go spend the rest of the, the entire summer in Stanford or try to do something useful. Not that spending time with my wife is not useful. But I, um, during these um, networking conversation, this yeah. meeting, I had met this guy called Greg Barsh mm-hmm. okay, um, in Stanford at the time within a... a, a a giant within our field, he identified a number of new genes as well. And I knew he worked at Stanford. And he was working, there was a community of them out there, and he was working together with a guy called Pat Brown um, out at Stanford, who's a professor of biochemistry, um, who had just invented the microarray. Okay, oh, So, so this was famous. This was pre... This was hand, you know, printed in a garage somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, this was pre ephemetrics and all these other uh, Illumina and all these chips that actually come. And and I knew this was happening. And I said, well, that sounds kind of fun. You know, I'm a molecular type person. Yeah. You know, and so and so I spoke to my to my boss, Steve Rightly. I said, look, Jane, my wife, uh, the fiance at the time, is going to Stanford. Should I? Uh, I'd like to go. Um, but I want to spend time in his lab. Could you do the intros for me? Could you email and says hi? And so he did. Mm-hmm. He did. And so I scored a summer in Stanford. And so I went along. And then I learned this, this a new community, a new now working in the lab within, um, within Stanford. But I learned this new um, technique, printing things in the middle of the night. And I brought this technique back to, to Cambridge. So when we when my wife was done and I was done, we came back. We came back to Cambridge, and I, I spoke to the department. I gave a talk about it. You know, a mm-hmm. seminar. Look, this is what I learned. What yep. did you do? And I begin to try and bring this particular technique, the microarray technique, into Cambridge. Yep. And oddly enough, it's I'm not, I can't even call myself a world expert, but I am. I'm an expert. I'm a technical. <laughs> I'm, I am an expert at it. It was this one little thing where I. I went, I sort of expanded my things about what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So I learned this technique, I brought it into Cambridge, and I became a t- technical expert on this, on this particular um, field, which has obviously evolved all the, way, all the way through now. And that's it. I teach it now. I run a core facility, mm-hmm. um, and people come to me to learn how to, to, to do it. What I think is interesting about that is that it's another instance in which it's really like a, a social force, this thing of you wanting to follow your wife, yeah. your fiance, yeah. uh, and be with her for the summer and then picking up the skill and then the skill follows you, right? So it's like, it's actually uh, tracking the movement of humans and social interactions rather than there was a dire need or scientific drive to learn this thing. It was, it definitely wasn't, well, if my wife had not needed to go to Stanford, I wouldn't have done it because there would be no yeah. motivation for me to find something to do in Stanford. Yeah. And and likewise, when I went out there to learn it, it wasn't my deep and once it was never the ambition, never to bring it back, introduce the, the the concept in the field, you know, bring the equipment and the expertise and actually pull it together to be able to do it in Cambridge. That was never mm-hmm. that was never the the um the plan. Yeah. It was just what happened. What do you find the most thrilling about your job? Do you know? I'll, can I give two answers? Absolutely. So I think that it is still very difficult to uh, match the thrill of making a bona fide discovery. And mm-hmm. what I mean by discovery, it can be big or small, by finding out something that no one else in all of history, you like to think, had mm-hmm. known prior to you actually looking at it. It could be tiny. So that thrill is still unmatched. It doesn't happen every day. It doesn't happen all the time at all, but, mm-hmm. or, or very often. But when it does, the thrill is unmatched. So that's the first thing. Mm-hmm. That's purely from the scientific perspective. But what I enjoy most about science is communicating it, I think. So mm-hmm. speaking to other people about it. Teaching. I like teaching. Mm-hmm. And so that thrills me the most when I impart. A lot of my colleagues don't like teaching because they think that they're not learning from it Mm -hmm. which i think is a a bad way of looking at it because Mm -hmm. i think you do learn something from it but i love to 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 teach we obviously know how the story ends which is that you become a person who's kind of known for their contributions to this the world of eating and obesity and all that stuff like when and how do you feel like the broader context and the, the broader scientific community studying uh those issues started to 
seep in and you start to transcend your your little genetics world. <laughs> I started to trans I don't know if I transcended anything. I okay. think I think I started to become more aware. When you're a PhD student, you're very short sighted. You're very myopic. Yes. You, you 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 look at your one little tiny itsy bitsy mm -hmm. teeny weeny thing, mm -hmm. and that's what you become an expert at. Yes. Then the same thing happens, I think, early on in the stage of a postdoc, right? Because you're given one gene to study. It's a very specific question. And but as you have a little bit of success, you begin to go to meetings and 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 talking, and you you actually begin to to not worry about trying to pass your viva and not worry about trying to write that thesis of yours, yeah. which is very thingy. But you're trying to start a career. You're trying. Mm -hmm. to, then you actually open your mind up more. You could argue I should have opened my mind up a bit more early early on. But then you then then I went to this this meetings. You began to hear. Then I began to realize there was a far larger community of people working on this different aspects different aspects of, of obesity we just were tackling the genetics aspect but people were looking at uh diseases associated with obesity people were dealing with how people try to lose weight you know yeah. everything yeah. surrounding it and that was when I, I realized that it was literally we were just doing we were trying to identify new genes um but being playing an important part of this cog in this whole other community of obesity scientists was that fun like this experience of expanding your community was it intimidating how was that so it was fun because this was the f i had attended one conference mm -hmm. um international conference when i was a phd student um and that was that was fun you know we went to it, it was new york actually we came to cool spring harbor new york state rather than new york city cool spring harbor and that was exciting but the moment we identified a new obesity gene mm -hmm. and then we identified one and two more after suddenly you're going to conferences in order to you go on tour you yeah. go on tour with your new gene <laughs> and and so then you begin meeting very different people particularly you know within nationally in europe and then internationally you then then i begin to meet people in other labs in other countries and that was then very interesting. Then I begin to find out about the cultures in other labs, mm -hmm. the cultures in other, um, in, yeah, not only the cultures in other countries, which is what we're all interested right. in when we study, but the niche question yeah. of how is it different to work in a lab in Barcelona? Yeah, yeah. You know, and so that, that was very interesting. Any cultures that stand out? Do you know, I, <laughs> the culture, I think, two, once again, health, two cultures stands out. Okay. Okay. Um, I had never worked in a lab in the United States. In mm -hmm. fact, I still, I did end up working in a lab in the United States. But by this, at this time, I had never worked in a lab in the United States. But I began to meet people who had, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and neither had I ever worked in a lab in Italy. Okay. Okay. And, and I cannot think of two cultures that are further apart, at least in the labs that I met. Okay. The American lab scenario, and people can tell me if I'm wrong, is tremendously Darwinian. You can tell me if I'm wrong. Mm. Okay, it is. It is. It, I mean, I think that certainly exists. I don't think it's all labs, but I think that certainly. It, I think a lot of people have had that experience. A lot of people have that experience. It's not all labs. I yeah. agree with you. But that was that was the vibe I got from a couple of people that that I mm -hmm. met, particularly in the labs on the on the east coast um, of the United States, and and very Darwinian. Then I went. I visited this um, this lab <laughs> this lab in. Um, in Italy, in which it can't be allowed now, it's not allowed now. Literally, you know those um, espresso makers mm -hmm. that you put on the stove, yep. kind of screw everything together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would have a hot plate in the lab, making the espresso in the lab. They were making espresso in the lab, and they were poor. And then they would put little. This is the espresso cup yeah. in, in the tissue culture hood as yeah. they're doing as they're doing were this. They also like lighting their cigarettes with the Bunsen burner. <laughs> I did. I did not see that. You didn't, okay. But I. But I thought the espresso making was a was was interesting. Yeah. So I know you've had a show on Netflix. You've written multiple books. Um, two books. Okay. Two more books than I've written. Uh, and just <laughs> generally have been you know communicating science uh, to the public. I'm curious as to how you got into that. I was at a dinner. Uh huh. Um, I forgot when actually, and I was still a postdoc at the time. And this was a dinner in a Cambridge college. Mm -hmm. And I, one of my senior colleagues was taking me to a feast. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's go, go back to Harry Potter. It was exactly like Harry Potter, long wooden tables. The only thing that wasn't there were the floating candles. Mm -hmm. And and we sat in our robes and I was opposite, I was opposite a 
bearded older professor of something or other okay and and you're sat all ne next to each other and he asked me what do you do okay and and like you do at this at the things and as we've been discussing what i told him oh i study severe obesity blah 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 and so i told him about about this mm -hmm. and he and he actually went do you know what i'm gonna do i'm not trying to be rude this is exactly what he did okay, okay? do you know what your problem is <laughs> I'm all there. This, I'm, we were in the starters, uh, appetizers at the moment. Yeah. I'm trying to have dinner in my head, I'm thinking, okay? And, and I says, dude. And he went, you give fat people an excuse. We just started dinner. So, so, so then, okay. obviously, then I spent dinner then trying to explain what I did. I don't know if I changed his mind. Mm -hmm. But I remembered um, very, it was unpleasant. It was an unpleasant experience, even yeah. though I had the opportunity to do some science communication. Yeah. I was going home in a cab. And I was thinking to myself, I said, this guy was an educated professor of whatever, uh, many alphabets after his name, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in Cambridge. And this is what he thinks yeah. about studying the genetics of, of obesity. And I remember thinking, oh, we got to do a better job. I mean, what was that? Did I do yeah. a good job explaining to him? And so that's actually where I think I need to be able to try and communicate this in a better yeah. way. What I did begin to do was then begin to do more science festivals. I would pop up and mm -hmm. speak at, you know, the local primary school with a knitted gut because I have a knitted gut, um, that, that kind of thing. So where some scientists don't have the opportunity to engage with the public or ever like have to explain what they're doing um, to non-scientists, you've done that quite frequently. And I'm, I'm wondering if that feeds back into the work, if there are ways in which knowing that you will have to explain it in a way that's accessible to the community ends up affecting literally what you choose to study or how you study it it influences two things mm -hmm. it influences um the questions i ask uh, in science yeah right because because then if you have a general idea of what people are interested in okay you shouldn't try and conduct a scientific career over just random stuff but it does mm -hmm. give you an idea and the second thing it gave me was perspective mm -hmm. and it gave me perspective because i was still um scientifically a molecular biologist i don't deal with actual patients and humans because i'm not um in, in a professional setting because i'm not a clinician mm -hmm. i still work um and my folks still work on small vials of colorless liquids that's mm -hmm. pretty much what we do mm -hmm. so it is very easy to forget remember I, when we were talking um about the fact that when i moved segued from puffer fish yeah. to the thingies it was just dna but when we get then when i started to do these communications and i would go out and actually meet people with obesity mm -hmm. um i'm suffering from the conditions i've been studying it gave me perspective. It, it meant that, oh, wait a minute. I just, it reminds me that I'm not just trying to be a myopic scientist. Yeah. I'm actually trying to help somebody. And mm -hmm. I think scientists need to remind themselves of that. I know a lot of scientists know this already. I needed to be reminded yeah. myself. So I think those, those two things. It made me a better scientist because it gave me perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think it made me improve the type of questions that I was asking in my science. What I really like about um, hearing about your path is that there are so many instances in which some social connection or social force shaped the direction that you went, whether that was your wife or it was like the chance uh, encounter of knocking on someone's door and they were welcoming um, and even hearing about just your thoughts on how social negativity in the scientific setting could, could dissuade people from pursuing it. And then on the other side, uh, I liked, it seemed like throughout your career, you were always expanding your community, meeting more people through that process, acquiring new skills, but maintaining some, some other relations, relationships consistently um, throughout your career. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any closing thoughts on the role of community in science. I think science, do, clearly, I, do, I don't want to sound like a fortune cookie, but I think um, science does not exist without the community, I think for sure. Um, I think that people stay in science because of the community. They leave for many different reasons. Mm -hmm. They leave because they don't like the hours. They leave because they don't like um, uh, the fact that things don't work all the time. They leave because of many other reasons. But I think that a huge reason why people stay in science is because um, because of the community, oh, in, in its broadest in its broadest mm -hmm. sense, either for those people who 
you know, are not particular are, are introverts, mm -hmm. but they like to work within their small community within the lab. Or I am an extrovert, or extroverts like me who like to keep expanding this community that I'm working at. I do think that that's the reason why people stay in science. Well, thank you so much for being here, Giles. This was really fun. Thank you so much for asking me all these weird questions I normally don't get asked. Thanks for listening to Kaleidoscope. Science happens because of community, and progress happens together. To learn more about how you can progress with ABCAM, visit abcam.com.